here today at the viewing of Process and Reprocess presented by the Front Room Gallery. We will be speaking with Joanne Unger and Janie Crimmins uh, regarding their process and their inspiration. And we also have today Daniel Acock, who will be touring the exhibition with us and navigating through the show. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. What we're viewing here is a digital twin of the Front Room Gallery. This is the uh, exhibition entitled Process and Reprocess, featuring the works of Joanne Unger and Janie Crimmins. So here we have a full view of the exhibition. And uh, I'm just really happy that everybody's able to join us today. And this is an opportunity for us to be able to view this uh, exhibition together, uh, you know, across the globe. So thank you everybody uh, for joining today. Uh, what we have here is an overall view of the show. And we're just gonna enter in and look at the two pieces on the main wall of the exhibition that are pairing of Joanne and Janie's work together. And the titles of these two pieces are Joanne's piece on the left, which is um, Acorn. And then the right piece is uh, Janie Crimmins, which is titled In Search of Beauty. Um, and this is kind of a nice place to start because we were talking about this and this was really, for both artists, a, a very new uh, way of working. So I thought that this is uh, kind of fun to see where they currently are within their own processes. And that's a lot of the things that we are also gonna be talking about today is process. Um, so uh, maybe Joanne, you can just uh, describe for people, just physically, you know, what are we looking at? What are the materials that you're using in your work here? This is encaustic, which is a, very century, it's a centuries old wax recipe for working with wax and um, with a organic resin mixed into it. And in addition to working with the wax or encaustic, I use the two words interchangeably, it's a found object, it's a cardboard object. And I do this a lot. This, uh, you're looking at it technically upside down if you look at the little curly cue at the very bottom of the piece, that hangs on a pole in a store. And in each of the slits in what maybe we will call each ovary <laughs> would be a slipper. This is a sales tool for acorn slippers, hence the name acorn. And um, it's a departure for me because rather than depending on the corrugation and folds of cardboard boxes, I'm using other marketing detritus. And most of the pieces in the show that you'll see will have some sort of die cutting. And what I mean by die cutting, I have a visual aid here, is cardboard that has holes cut out of it or uh, shapes cut out of it. This is a, a box for, um, menorah candles for my Jewish friends. Um, so a lot of the pieces, you'll see these additional shapes cut out. Um, and uh, that's it. Fantastic. Well, we're definitely going to get more into the process. I just wanted to kind of as an introduction, have you describe physically what we're seeing because uh, you use like a wood panel and then you're laminating these icon uh, cardboard or paper cutouts to it with a, a wax, a pigmented wax, and in this yep. case, it's an encaustic. You know, you know the. Although lamination is probably technically what I'm doing, I've started over the last year or two. I've started thinking about. I've started in my head. I always jump to using the word embalm. I feel like I'm embalming um, objects for because preservation. Because it is a way of preserving the material, right? I mean, in wax, yeah. you know, that was one of the yeah. earliest uh, preservation methods. Yeah. So it's interesting you use that term for that. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and the Egyptians did use encaustics. They're the ones who developed it, and that's how they painted their... Uh, well, I know, the, I know mummies isn't the right word. Sarcophagi? 
And also, I forgot to tell you guys that I have pigmented the wax and also painted the cardboard. And that's where the uh, color aspect comes in. It's not just cardboard and wax. There's a lot of pigment in there also. Yeah, beautiful color use for those too. Yes, and they work so well with Janie's piece. Exactly. How was yeah, that for and a that's segue? That's what's so exciting about this pairing is just looking at these color relationships internally yeah. between your work and then comparatively uh, between the two. So Janie, um, maybe you could describe just uh, in kind of broad strokes for people what this material is that you're using to make these conceptions. Okay, well, first I actually start with um, just the, you know, catalogs. They're printed with metallic inks, so they don't really uh, decompose if they are recycled. And I feel like I'm keeping them out of the waste stream. And also the other thing I use in my work is um, security envelopes. I don't know if everybody can see that. Move it a little bit over, oh, over there. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, I didn't hold the catalog up enough, but so um, I shred all of these things. And basically this is the size of the shred. It's very small. And um, my source materials come from marketing tools, which is very similar to what Joanne uses as far as her materials that she begins her process with. And um, they're, they're difficult to recycle. And also they promote the constructs, constructs of beauty, wealth, and taste, which then I deconstruct and uh, try to create my own narratives from that. And I'm just going to pick up what happens when I, uh, this is the size of the shred rolled up that I actually work with. And um, I also create different sewn, I don't know if it's, in, you can see it sewn. Hold that one up again for a little bit longer so we can really see, um, see that. Can, yeah. These are sewn together and folded yeah. and sewn. So these are folded. The first uh, shred I showed you was rolled, and then these are also sewn. I don't know. And um, so it's a very meditative, um, glorious practice. So maybe in this case, because you are showing this really tiny components, maybe you could hold this up one more time for everybody, Janie. Okay, so. They could see. So yeah. the, uh, the shred is, Pretty yeah. small. I use a diamond cut shredder, which they don't make anymore. So I bought every one of them off of eBay. Um, and then <laughs> eBay's the, the best friend, right? <laughs> and then this is, I don't know, I'm trying to show the size of the shred. I have to use a, um, a, a, a tweezer to place each little rolled shred. And uh, then I also fold. Can you see that? Fold yeah. and the shreds together. And then I use the shreds whole and sew them together as well. And the color is all from the catalog, right? Yes, I, I don't use paint. I, have, I make all these rules for myself. The rules are like, you have to use exactly what you get. You can't change anything, no paint. You know, it's just, the materials are just bare bones and that's what I use. And my armatures are from various different sources. Like the first image that um, Kate and Daniel showed. First of all, I want to thank you both for inviting me to show with you guys. I'm very honored, so thank you. And um, and it's an honor to show with Joanne Unger because I am a collector of her work, actually. So, <laughs> um, but um, I used uh, for the In Search of Beauty series that we're going to look at, I used um, architectural, uh, actual architectural details that I purchased. And for the um, A Field Guide to Getting Lost series, I used uh, different forms that I found and were not manufactured in the same way. Great. So, Okay, so now we're gonna re-enter the exhibition. And so what happens now when we do this is that your windows, both Joanne and Janie will still be speaking. And for people to be able to see you, 
Um, you just have to move your upper arrow to left or right until you find that they're both on spotlight. So that they should come up first. Um, but now we're going to go back into the gallery. Um, so here we are again. And hopefully you can also still see me here, Kathleen yeah. Vance, and uh, John Unker and Janie Crimmins to your right screen. So now we're back in the exhibition and we just talked a little bit about these two pieces that are um, hung together, Acorn and In Search of Beauty. And now we thought that it'd be nice to take everybody over to the lap to the blue wall, um, which is um, installed to, to have two groupings, one of Joanne's work and one really nice jo um, installation of mm -hmm. Janie's pieces. For people that are joining us, if you could just make sure that your microphone is off, and, um, and that way we won't have uh, other audio coming in. We can just hear uh, Joanne and Janie. <clears throat> so the, the left grouping is Joanne Unger's works there, and there's uh, of the five components, five pieces there, we have satellite, Cord doodads, Sally Hansen complete salon manicure, uh, Premier Zeus number one, and OG Hydroganics. <laughs> right, John? So, Julian, tell us how do you come up with these titles for these pieces? Uh, each of these pieces has a cardboard box embedded or embalmed within it. And I paint the box. Um, but the title of the piece is lifted from the box. So whatever product the box held, that's the name of the piece. And I'd like to shout out, shout out to uh, Larry and John, who are the new owners of Sally Hansen Complete Beauty. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. yeah, and also, Kate, thank you. The colors look great. You did a really good job in uh, setting this all up. Wonderful. I'm really glad. We, uh, we had a lot of uh, difficulty trying to get the color accuracy for this exhibition tour. Um, sometimes it's an easy capture and we're able to do these and the color comes out correctly. But I think that, the, that because there's such a sensitivity in the color usage, both for Joanne and Jeannie, that it was really tricky to do this. But I think that also, yeah, it did turn out um, nicely. We do have a comment here from uh, Karen Margulis who says the show looks so beautiful. Both artists work uh, look so amazing together. So thank you, Karen. Um, so we were thinking when we did the did a preview tour that it might be nice to get up close to these, right, Joanne? Yeah, yeah. There's a couple of um, th this particular grouping um, showcases a few of the newer techniques that I'm using. And since it's a show about process, I'm very comfortable in talking about uh, what's going on here. If you could start with the uh, doodads one, Daniel, that's, yeah, that one. I, I mentioned earlier that I was working with uh, die cutting, uh, cardboard that had die cuts. And this may look like it's got some dark blue blobs in it, but they're not dark blue blobs. They are little holes that are cut out of the packaging um, in funny little shapes. It was packaging to hold, you know, when you get earbuds and they give you all different sizes of sleeves or uh, condoms to put over the buds to put in your ear. <laughs> <laughs> this was a little um, package of those sure things, <laughs> and all those little holes were holding the doodads. Yeah. No, um, sure it's like boy, right. really cheap, And uh, if you if you go to the yeah. side view of the satellite one, Daniel, just to its left, Daniel. Yes, she wants to go to the side. Okay. To the sides view. The side view. Oh, you mean yeah. to go to look on the? I know what she's talking about. Yeah, we. Yeah. 
We also have a comment here from Beth Derry. He says, agreed, these are like gorgeous time capsules. So Beth Derry is another artist that we work with at the front room and you can look through the archives and see a tour like this of her work as well. Um, yeah, so this is a good view, right, Joanne? To see yeah, is it, can, is it possible to get closer? Um, that's as close as we can get. Okay. If you look along the edge of um, the piece on the left, can you point? Yeah, right there. That's what I want you all to see. On um, One of the techniques that I've used in a number of the pieces in this show is I've used a router and I've sculpted the, the wood panel before I poured wax into it. You can see they look like little notches, but that's really just sort of the uh, cross uh, cross view. No, what's the word? Side view. Uh, yeah, it's the side view of, of it's an elevation view of what I've done to the um, panel. And if you, we look in the from the front now, Daniel, you can see it's it's not overwhelmingly obvious. It's pretty subtle, but you'll see like waviness and um, uh, suggestion of uh, sandy beach maybe with organic wave patterns in it. Can you go down, Daniel? Oh, I thought she was talking about. Yeah, right there, yeah. Oh, right there, yes. That effect is caused by the um, sculpting of the the base we look what we're actually seeing is different layers different depths of wax so the deeper it is the less opaque the less transparent it is and the shallower it is the more transparent it is and then of course as usual i've painted the cardboard that's laid on top of it so you're seeing several different things happening all at once and true to my uh, commitment to die cutting you can see the cardboard has lots of stuff cut out of it, including one gorgeous little hole in the very center. Yeah. Um, and another thing that uh, you're seeing here, you can uh, zoom out a little, Daniel, to see the whole group, is something that um, so, yeah, I, it's, it's, and I have been uh, playing around with a lot, which is um, having having works set up in these grids, Swiss grids, if if I think that's the proper term, where where different pieces have conversations with each other. In the past, it's always been just one piece on a white wall. But moving forward, especially and starting now, I'm interested in how these works talk to each other. Like if you look at the top two, it looks as if the orange panel. And, and, and Sally Hansen on the right is talking to the orange panels and the piece on the left. And um, ditto for the pale orange on the bottom. And because I'm using these die cut shapes, I have a, more variables of geometries to talk to each other in these constellations. And you'll see more of this as we move throughout the show. Yeah, definitely coming up into the larger installation. Yeah. It's interesting to think about the geometry of the forms that are created within the works. And then that 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 makes the determination of the size of the panel, correct? That the That's right. That's right. I, I forgot I have another visual aid here. It's just a little one. But um here is a let me see, this was a Clinique box. Yeah, why don't we go out so we can see you up close? Okay. Um, okay. I don't know if you could see, but it's been painted. This was a box for a Clinique product. And what I did was I flipped it over and I painted one side of it. And this is very typical of what's inside each of my pieces. And after I get a painted cardboard piece that I like. I take some plywood and I cut it to size. This one hasn't quite been cut to size. It's close. But 
the size of the panel is dictated by the box. So I would cut it right down the edge here. And that's why all my work is such odd shapes and not standard sizes of paintings, much to Daniel's chagrin. He always wants. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you just make standard sizes? <laughs> but it is, it makes it more complex. Uh, it, it does. Work. It does. I think that that answers. So, Jeannie Bardo was asking, how do you get the gradation of colors on the cardboard? Does that come from the pigment in the wax or do you paint them that way? So, I think that that was a really great visual aid to answer. Uh, uh, I have another one. This is, uh, this was a prescription for something or other something nasty i'm sure and i there's another painted box and uh janine the answer is um spray bottles uh sometimes, aerosol spray right yeah mm -hmm. i'm moving away because i in the past probably this was done with spray paint <laughs> but i'm moving away from i'm trying to move completely away from toxic materials and I'm now mixing uh, pigments and inks in aerosol spray bottles and spraying that way instead of uh, aerosol spray paints, just for uh, the benefit of the environment and also my own set of lungs. Well, Jeannie writes, ah, oh, those are beautiful too. We have another question coming in from uh, Karen uh, Schifano, who says, Joanne, do you think about creating light that seems to emanate from the work there are light lines that might be the edges and be embedded in the wax so i think that she's referring to the folds right yeah um karen i love that it appears that light is emanating from my work but i don't that's not what i focus on when i'm making it uh in order to create that effect though when i paint a box I painted in a very special way so that the geometry and the folds of the box are going to pop. They're, and I also think, the way that it's open that when you tear it, that kind of like the yeah, that's yeah. infected. So that's what's causing that, right? Yeah, you can see right here, this area on the bottom, that's from um, when the, a layer, the top layer of the cardboard has been ripped off, which often happens because the boxes are glued together. Yeah. So, you know, over it the- like a soft geometry, right? When you do that. Yeah, yeah. So let's go back in uh, and just to keep us on track with time. Yeah. We'll look one more time at your grouping and then we're gonna move over to Janie's um, trio of pieces to the right. And these three, Janie has the title of uh, In Search of Beauty. And these are number seven, number nine, and number 11 um, from that series. I just, I really love the, the, the different way of working between Joanne's layering and uh, Jan Janie's layering of material and very different processes and different uh, handling of the materials. Um, so Janie and these, the way you showed us earlier, the rolled paper that becomes almost like a beading process there. So maybe you can, you can, um, talk us more about, um, you know, to me, I imagine it's kind of a meditative process in creating these. Is that the case? It's, it is a meditative process, but it also reflects the domestic work of women in the past, or maybe even now. And um, so I always think of myself as going back in the past in a way when I'm making my work, but also bringing myself into the present by, you know, this process of being very meditative and quiet. And, um, you know, Joanne focused a lot about um, process, but I feel like I could focus more on the reprocess part of it because I start with these, you know, solicitations that are all annoying for all of us. And I start with the catalogs and I start with the security envelopes and I just shred everything. And um, that for me breaks down 
the meaning and the thrust of what we are supposed to be interested in as far as marketing. And um, I just feel like the repurposing of these materials gives it a different life and I can create my own narratives about what I want. And basically the whole idea of In Search of Beauty was to deconstruct what we are sold as beauty, wealth and taste and to make my own narratives about what I think beauty is. And that's why In Search of Beauty was really a very important to me because it just took what we are fed and took all that information. And then I <coughs> it all. I dismantled what I felt like we were being pushed, what was pushed onto us. And I created my own story from it. So that's, that's my reprocessing of what we are fed as consumers. And you've created beautiful objects from those, right? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have a question coming in from uh, Jeannie. Uh, hold on. Uh, yes, from Jeannie. Right here. Yeah, Jeannie. Uh, you, this, uh, this is coming in from Jeannie Bordeaux. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, Jeannie, do the patterns come organically or do you have a pattern in mind when you set the roll and sewn paper? Uh, good question, Janine. Um, on these, <laughs> I actually bought preformed forms, but just like with my work that I start from scratch and I use found objects or different armatures, I always draw something and then I ignore it. Well, it was the same thing with these. <laughs> I purchased things and then I ignored what was actually happening on them. I don't know why <laughs> I did that, but that's what I did. And the patterns actually come from, um, you know, a natural object, and um, architectural details and geometric patterns and patterns that are, you know, that are part of my daily life. I walk all over the place in New York City and, you know, so many different things, architectural details, uh, manhole covers or person hole covers, if you will. And um, just, you know, I just feel like- um, Yes, Jamie, be inclusive, <laughs> love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, all different applications of design just seep into my being. And then I go back to my studio and that there they are. So that's really where they come from. Thank you for asking. And Beth Derry comments that it's stunning. And Joanne Unger has a very interesting question. She says, is In Search of Beauty a book? Um, is it a book? It is not a book. It's my journey. <laughs> my, I mean, it could be a book, but it could I'm, be a book. Right? Um, it could be a good title for a book. Is it driving? I think so. Um, it, okay, but that does bring up an interesting question too. Is um, you're using in this case the uh, restoration hardware catalogs for the not in this series. In this series, I'm using uh, various catalogs. Like it could be a MoMA catalog. It could be um, a travel catalog. The, in Search of Beauty was using more marketing, like diverse marketing tools where the brown work is all restoration hardware. Okay. I guess that makes sense because of the color in yes. the, right? That beautiful blue and the, and the bright colors in the center there. Um, I'm gonna see if we can see it from a little bit of a different angle. I just, Daniel just stepped away for a moment. Um, so I'm gonna be the one navigating. So excuse my uh, skills here. Um, there, maybe he had it better before. But yeah, you can kind of see the volume, you know, the relief of these. Uh, from the side view, um, that it's not just the flat um, to the wall construction that you're doing, that there is like a nice volume uh, as you're building to them. Um, shall we continue around to Joan Unger's uh, main installation in the exhibition? For both uh, Janie and Joanne, um, it was a kind of nice and fun exhibition to put together because each artist got 
um, uh, the ability to do one larger, uh, you know, wall. Lot, wall installation uh, with the uh, modular units from individual works. So in this case, um, it was really fun to work with the colors in Joanne's work to get this kind of gradation um, moving through. And here you can see the different varieties of uh, the compositions that are made from the package of material, as well as some insertion of more collage based works. Right, Joanne? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, a there's two pieces in here. They're both in the top row, one on the far right and one second to the left that have, um, collaged elements in them instead of just um, packaging. And it, it's different for what you've probably seen, but it's uh, very natural for me because I've, I've always done collaging. And uh, in my own head, what I'm doing with the wax and the boxes is a form of collage. So um, the one in the top left, I just took it a little further with a, a bit of uh, drawing and, uh, and, and paper. Uh, the other thing that you can see here is if, can you go to the horizontal one on the top row, Kate? Yeah, Daniel's back, so. <laughs> oh, Daniel. Yeah, that one. This is another example of, um, again, something new, but you can see more clearly here how I've manipulated the surface of the wood. Uh, this doesn't have any cardboard in it. This is just um, etched out wood panel. I, I use a router uh, and, and pigmented wax. And I've also painted the wood. And, and then uh, this one has a really great title of Ant Path yeah. for it. So this just makes you think of like an ant colony. It does, and, it does. And yeah. And Karen me, right, it's very exciting to see the collage, Joanne. I love it. Thank you. Uh, moving forward in my work, I will probably, you will we'll probably see more um, at uh, relief bases. What I mean is instead of simply using a plain wood base, I'm going to be cutting into the wood in different ways. Um, still under exploration, um, but I'm moving forward that way. Um, also, the piece on the top right is another example of a um, relief base where the base has been etched in. Uh, the black lines are painted wood and where the wood was etched away, it's filled with yellow wax. And that's sort of how you can define the yellow and black stripes. And then there's a painted box on top of it. And I'm sorry, the photography in this particular instance on this piece isn't doing it justice. If you look at it in the main show, there's a lot more detail and it's not quite as rugged as it looks here. Also, again, you can see that there's some die cutting on the box, giving me that circle in the top right, which I really like a lot. Really into these uh, quirky die cutting holes and spaces. And it's not always visible, but nearly every piece in this exhibit has some sort of die cutting involved in it. Um, yeah, really amazing shapes. I like yeah. the, the two, the kind of diptych piece down below the bottom right. The yeah, that, that actually is a diptych. And um, sometimes I can't, after I've been working on a piece, I can't remember what the cardboard is originally from. And uh, in the, that is the case here with this diptych. So I titled it seatbelt because it reminds me of the clicky things that you put together to tuck yourself into a seatbelt. Not an overly intellectual title, I know, but that's, that's what I think of. And if you go just to the left a little bit, the green and yellow, vertical piece is one of my personal favorites. That is, uh, again, you can see lots of die cut shapes in there. 
And that is packaging from a water bottle. So oh, the yeah. top circle was hanging around the, the mouth of the bottle. And uh, you can see the little holes below it that were used to hang on the rod in the store. But I just love the composition and detail that I got from this particular piece of marketing detritus. And that Beth Derry is asking, is this a single piece? I assume that she's referring to the entire installation. So we did install this with the hope, you know, that the, the one person would come and buy all of the pieces together, but they really are kind of conceived as individual works. Um, and then for anybody that is interested, um, we would work with you to, uh, if you had selected pieces that you were interested in purchasing, that we would work together, myself and uh, Joanne, to do the composition that would uh, work together with the pieces. Right, Joanne? That's correct. And also moving forward, I'm gonna start creating um, work with multiples in mind. Um, uh, using similar sizes, shapes, colors, packaging, so that uh, it, it, it'll be a different type of grouping. Right. Um, and uh, John Weiss just uh, wrote, he says, apologies, but we need to jump off. So glad we got to see these pieces in purses person or in person earlier this month and thrilled that we have some of Joanne's work hanging on our walls now. So thank you, John. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's what's so fun about these pieces is that, that each one uh, is an individual work, but they also have a really nice communication between uh, one another. And you can do kind of pairings and trios and five, yeah. you know, five piece installations and <clears throat> really have fun with them. So now we are going to move across the gallery to look at Janie's installation. Let's see if I can get to a good point here to view it overall. Maybe here. That's good. Yeah. Oops. Uh, so Janie, can you tell us uh, more about this larger installation um, and maybe some more of the concepts that you're thinking about when you were developing it? Um, this series is called A Field Guide to Getting Lost and it's based on this is based on a book by Rebecca Solnit. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, it's, it's and Rebecca Solnit uh, has studied psychogeography, which I'm not an expert on, but um, basically what she has had inspired me to do was to shut off my phone, all my navigation tools and everything, and just wander. And um, so all of these forms are based on me wandering through yeah. Central Park, wandering through the streets of New York and just absorbing whatever I did. And then for some reason, I chose <laughs> the restoration hardware catalogs and they used to be on Broadway near Union Square. And uh, I went in and the security guard let me take a whole bunch of them. And uh, that's how I created this series. Nice. And um, because I never, I haven't bought from them in a very long time because they find them very expensive. So I didn't receive their catalogs myself. But um, anyway, when Joanne was talking about feeling like she creates collages and she's working on reliefs, that's very, very close to what I believe that I'm doing. I mean, obviously my work is a relief, it's raised, but um, I do feel like I'm a collage artist because I am gluing paper to a substrate. So I feel like uh, in, in so many ways, our works overlap by using, you know, found marketing materials or packaging materials and calling ourselves collage artists and, you know, manipulating materials in a way that are really different from their source material. And um, I do miss 
my old studio because I was near Joanne and I have a kind of funny story about restoration hardware. <laughs> she was making a collage and she was in the middle of it. And I knew immediately that one of the pieces of her collage was from restoration hardware. And she was able to find the page in the catalog to add to that image. And I just thought that was perfect. <laughs> True story. This really happened. <laughs> so I really, I really miss you, Joanne. I miss those moments so much. <laughs> and uh, I, I, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know what else to say about um, a field guide to getting lost, except that it was really, it took a year. I spent a year working on all of these pieces. It takes me a very long time to create these works because of the um, small materials that I'm working with. But it was a year of absolute pleasure not being connected to my phone. So that was pretty wonderful. I love that. Uh, maybe we can look at it a little bit from the side because what I think is interesting in this too is the um, the, the the construction, the, the volume of them. And, and we had discussed this a little bit too is that some of the forms really do seem like they're like almost like tribal um, forms for them. And I don't know if you wanted to just speak to that um, at all, Janie. You know, so many people have said that they felt tribal to them. I think part of it is the palette. It's just, you know, because they're very earthy feeling and very natural feeling. And I mean, some of some of the forms are, if you could move to the, a little bit, what is that to the left? <laughs> I don't know. Um, to, um, there's a form that's a, like this flower form that, you know, I, I walk through parks. I walk through gardens in the parks and, you know, just all of these forms really spoke to me. And I never thought about them having a connection to another culture or anything, but they seem to. So I don't know what that says. Maybe it is because I haven't, I didn't pick up my phone when I was doing all of this stuff. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, Pat, uh, Patty says that she loves that book so much. And it's, it is a really interesting reference to that. I think that, it, you know, that we should all take a moment, you know, take a little time and disconnect from our geolocating, right? Um, uh, Karen writes, Janie, I think you've tapped into the collective unconscious of symbolism. Woo, thank That's you, Karen. Nice <laughs> uh, Joanne Unger says they're so beautiful, Joanne. <laughs> they are, especially up close when you can see all the texture. Mm -hmm. She also says, that's what Karen, what Karen says. <laughs> so yeah that's a very nice comment of karen that you've tapped into the collective unconscious of I, I think that's beautiful thank you very much karen mm -hmm. yeah so let's now unless you have any other thing you'd like to add while we're viewing this um why don't we go down to the end cap wall or the back wall daniel um, where again, we have a really nice pairing of Joanne and Janie's work. And you can see, you know, that the, the colors that you both use are, they're really, they're, well, this is, you have to step back maybe. Um, they're really unique to each, each piece. But when the field guide to getting lost, because you were using this restoration uh, hardware the catalogs, they were kind of, uh, you know, more browns and more neutral um, colors. But then going here, there are this like a violet, a lavender and a blue in Janie's work. So we were able to select with a pairing with jo uh, Joanne's, you know, kind of color pickups to make like a really nice uh, conversation. Yeah, the, I think the, the color conversation is really interesting here. Mm -hmm especially how the green fits in, even though Janie hasn't used any green. Have you? <laughs> Not in these pieces, no. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really nice pairing. And I love the echoing of shapes, uh, the circle die cut hole in mine, and then the circle uh, in the center of Janie's and the little ones all around it. And, you know, even like I am using it as a diamond, but 
the squares really reflect the squares in your work, especially in the um, more magenta one. Yeah, yeah. Um, another, in the magenta one on the left, it's an example of something else I've been experimenting with that's new in this body of work, which is um, pigment dispersal. Uh, in the past, I've always worked with flat fields of color and been very careful to make sure that my pigments were seamless and almost slick. But uh, lately I'm into uh, when the pigment either doesn't dissolve all the way or gets picked up from the surface below and gets um, moved around in the waves of hot wax. And that uh, purpley pinkish one is a good example of that. It's just yet another element um, I'm mixing in. I, I'm like Janie, I make these rules for myself. You know, it's got to be cardboard box, it's got to be wax, you know, the size has to be the size of the box. Um, so it's fun to find different ways to create uh, variety and uh, content. It's interesting also that uh, I feel like both of us only follow our own rules. And nobody else. <laughs> Absolutely. I love yeah. that. Patty writes uh, such a great pairing, both visually and thematically. So that's a nice comment from- uh, Hi, Patty. Patty Fabricant. So uh, we have one more wall of works to look at. And again, it was like a very interesting thing for us. Um, to think about the communication between your two works, um, texturally and in color, um, they're both abstract works, but in some ways definitely dealing with pattern uh, and geometry and symmetry. Um, so in Janie's works uh, are, are most of the time very symmetrical in the patterning, right Janie? Most of the time, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, uh, the die cut form of Joanne's does have uh, a compositionally uh, symmetry to it, but there's a, quite a big uh, gradient variant in the coloration there. Yeah, um, and it, it's not fully symmetrical. It is left to right, but not top to bottom, which, mm -hmm. which I like a lot. And also this is another example of me playing around with pigment dispersion. Um, I, and again, I think like that piece is just breathing. At, it's so alive, Joanne, it's beautiful. Thank you. I love the two of them together. The way they, um, they, they the purples and the teal blues sort of talk to each other. It's, it's, uh, it's a really good pairing. It is. It's a great dialogue. Kate and Daniel did amazing job installing this show. It's true. It's true. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more Pete pairing that on this wall. I, I really want somebody to purchase these together. Me um, too. Yeah. Why I think, not? <laughs> I think that there's so so many you know similarities and but differences too between your works and it opens up all kind of different uh ways of thought about time process um and i i do feel like they both have kind of a meditative quality to them beth Derry writes beauties uh, <laughs> uh there which i totally agree yes um, they're beautiful, beautiful, beautiful pieces. Um, and here, and the, the color, we try to be as active as we can in, in these recordings, but those flares coming out of Janie's pieces have this beautiful kind of um, uh, orange kind of a pickup to them, right? A little yes. the orange, yes. which we really were uh, looking at to do with the pairing of Joanne's, which has this like very nice gradient color fields uh, going across them. Um, so this pairing in particular for me was one of the most exciting um, to have in the exhibition because it's so it's from such 
uh, range of color and color temperature too, going from like the really warm to the extremely cold, uh, which is challenging, you know, to work with. Um, uh, you know, you know go ahead. Uh, it's interesting because, you know, Joanne and I both use a lot of blue in our work. Um, and, you know, for me, blue is like the color of the ocean, the color of inland waters, the color of the sky. It means loyalty to me. It's meditative. It's calming. And I just feel like these two pieces together with the blue and the orange, which is a little bit like the complementary colors, I just there's something about these two together and I really do feel like it's a great dialogue. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth Mead writes, sunny exhibition, thoughtfully and beautifully installed. Congratulations to you both. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. So why don't we just back out so we can see the, again, like the whole exhibition together because we just have two minutes left, guys. Um, I think we crossed a lot of uh, territory uh, in discussing the process and reprocess as the title and also the concept, you know, of your, your uh, working. Yeah. Really beautiful show, ladies. Thank Thanks. you so much for this opportunity and to everybody for sharing their time with us today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, uh, Front Room, you did a beautiful job uh, with this show. Thank you, you so much. You never looked better. Thank <laughs> you.